good afternoon. Uh, uh, I would like, on behalf of the Center for Hellenic Studies, to welcome here tonight uh, Professor Martin Puchner on my left, who uh, was uh, kind enough to come here and uh, uh, give us uh, a lecture uh, on the very uh, uh, exciting topic, uh, which reads Work Literature from Mesopotamia to the Moon. And I understand he will be uh, 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 sort of uh, um, using uh, uh, aspects from his uh, well-known book on the written world. Uh, and uh, as a discussion, we are honored to have tonight uh, with us um, uh, the uh, professor uh, um, Dimiroulis, who is a professor at the University of Pandion and a member of uh, the uh, Society uh, of the Philek Pedeftiki Etheria, uh, uh, who is also well known in the area of uh, uh, philology, writing, uh, 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 and, and so on. So uh, I hope that uh, we can have a, a constructive discussion uh, which will illuminate some aspects of what we are about to be talking about uh, uh, in a few uh, in a few moments uh, to, to us. Uh, welcome to both of you, and thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, uh, uh, if I may, sort of uh, uh, begin the discussion, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Buchner, uh to give us, uh, uh, in a few words, uh, 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 or as few as possible, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the central ideas uh, of, of what uh, uh, the, the work uh, is and uh, the, the, the subject of your talk will be. Sure. Um, I think the, the center of it is an experience we all share, namely that you're living through a very unusual and rare moment in history, namely a moment when new technologies of writing are changing the way we communicate with written words. And I think we can all sense how profound that change is, how many aspects of our lives are touched by it. So I, what I wanted to do is look back at history and focus on earlier moments when new technologies came along and changed the way uh, writing worked uh, from the very first invention of writing uh, to different types of scripts, the invention of the alphabet, of course, so importantly connected to Greece, um, to writing materials from parchment and, and papyrus to, to paper, um, and, it's, and then of course the most well-known one, uh, the invention of print first in China and then the reinvention of print in Northern Europe, and, and basically to look at how that those moments of technological change also changed the way storytelling, written stories, literature, writ large, uh, uh, um, were, were influenced by that. So that's the, that's the, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, I was fascinated by your book, especially by the chapter titled The New and the Old. Do you think that there's a way of going back to old technologies yeah. today? And if there is a way, how we can do that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And it's something that I didn't expect would be an important topic when I started. But then the more I studied these different technologies and the kind of ways of reading and formats and technologies they part with them, the more I was struck that by our own writing technology. I mean, there's a lot new, uh, but I was struck by two aspects that, that almost returned us to an earlier moment. Uh, I begin the book with cuneiform writings in, on, on clay tablets. Um, clay tablets and tablets in general relatively quickly were superseded by other formats, the scroll, mm -hmm. and then the Roman codex, the book. Um, but now, of course, for the first time, we are using tablets again. <laughs> and, and I... With the scroll. 
and, yes. and that's the second one, exactly, that, that the scroll was basically superseded by the book. Because the book is a great information technology system, you can flip through, you're not yeah. tied to linearity, you can have an index, uh, um, it's easy to transport. Uh, uh, but now we are scrolling down our computer screens because you know code translates writing as a continuous string of codes and yes you can you can represent pages but it's really continuous so you scroll down our screens so so it's interesting that our technology has revived some of these older formats but in, in another sense the only way to approach these technologies is to believe that although we uh, go back to, to the past and, and sometimes exploit some of these old technologies. On the other hand, there is no way of going back because yes. technology always goes ahead through in time. Yes. And the, the, the other question is, and I, I found your idea very, very stimulating, uh, that uh, the new technologies always uh, encompass the old ones yes. and they create something new, yes. radio, yes. online radio, and the same thing. Yes. So that's very interesting. You know? It is, and it, I think that's perfectly expressed. Nothing gets lost in a sense. It's it's in, it's incorporated, as you put it. It's and sometimes you know all computers mimic the format of the book, yeah. for example, yeah. uh, um, and 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 the same. Since we've been focusing on on the technology side of the book, the other side is different kinds of storytelling and, and there we can see as well that some of the most ancient texts get always transliterated, transformed, transcoded, transmediated as some people say into these new media and forms uh, um, and adapted uh, uh, while also at the same time these new technologies bring with them New ways of storytelling. So that, but it's the same. I think the same is true with the stories that they don't get lost. They get transformed and preserved and and changed along with uh, with the new technologies. So in a way, uh, you describe your, your the four stages you you mentioned in your book. Yeah. So you start with the first stage. I mean, yeah. from the tablets, and then you go on exactly. to the other stages yeah. until you come to the present. Uh, digital. Yes. Uh, so the, 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 the crucial word here is storytelling. Yes. It's very fashionable also in Greece now to, to talk about storytelling yes. and, and narrative and narratives and stories. Yes. Now, I, I may I ask a question about that? Yes. In what way uh, new technologies are related to new practices, to new power practices? Yes. Because if we talk just about technologies, we leave out the new technologies that have to do with power ideology and power relations. Absolutely. Now, very much so, and especially if you if you think about these different technologies, especially the last two, print and then the internet, they, for all their advantages, meant that authors basically lost control of the production process, yeah. and that powerful institutions, companies, states, we're basically controlling print. This is why with the, with the rise of, of, of print, you also have the rise of censorship. And, and I have a, a, a chapter in the book <coughs> about Anna Ahmatova and, and writing under Stalin, where writers like Ahmatova, even though she could, you know, print existed, she couldn't have access to it because it was controlled by a torture. Or by the system who was hiding his, exactly. his novels. And, and, you know, it, the same <laughs> last night, I was having dinner with two friends, and next to us was Mark Zuckerberg and his wife. And so this is what here, the, huh? yes, here now. Nice. Yes, uh, uh, they were literally. I, I heard it in the news. Today. Yeah, they were sitting right next to us. Uh, 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 a wonderful restaurant with view of with the uh, Acropolis. And so you know, this is so now it's also partly state owned, but of course these big mega corporations. Uh, own these means of productions, and we are. I think there's a big. We're in the middle of a big struggle about uh, about that. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. These new technologies bring uh, with them huge questions of who controls and owns yeah. censorship uh, yeah. and all of that. Uh, would you agree with uh, Friedrich Kittler uh, in, in his metaphor that we are living in a world, and we have the illusion? which is like the illusion of, of people traveling by plane 
and uh, they, they think that reality in front of them is the, the host that uh, smiles and the nice you know, uh, film that they watch and this sort of thing, whereas the real reality is outside, which means you know, minus 50 and this sort of thing. So in a way, the media create a kind of reality which is a fake reality in yeah. a way. Um, I certainly think that every medium creates a form of reality. I think that's yeah. certainly true. Um, when it comes to, in part, for me, it's so. It sounds like this metaphor has to do with images. I kind of almost I hear echoes of the Platonic cave here. Uh, um, the way I would put it, with respect to storytelling and writing, is that clearly storytelling, the way we tell stories, is a is a plays a big role in how we understand the world how it works, how we get from A to B, and also our place within it. And so to the extent that new, different technologies shape storytelling, they certainly shape our view of the world indirectly. I mean, so that's, so the, the play metaphor strikes me as a little bit extreme. Yeah. Um, and there's always the question, well, what is that unmediated reality outside mm -hmm. the airplane and how do we get to it? But, but there's, the, the, there's no doubt in my mind that because writing and storytelling is such an important social uh, activity uh, uh, and a lot of questions of philosophy and, and, and religion and all of that are bound up with it. Religious texts play a big role in my book. Uh, I think they clearly have a very, I mean, that's in a way my thesis, how literature shaped history. And so the shaping power, I think, is very important. I found very interesting, you know, the, the comparison you, you make between sacred texts and mm. the Communist Manifesto, for instance. Yes. And uh, uh, I would like also to, to point out, you know, uh, the, 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 the other book that you've written on, on uh, um, manifestos. Oh, mm, yes. And I found very interesting the fact that you, uh, you, you in a way, you write a book about the poetic uh, rhetoric of manifestos. Yes. As, as books that in a way are similar to, to sacred texts. Yes. And it's the first time that I've read because I teach that topic too. Yeah. Here, oh. and manifestos, modernist manifestos, mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. I think it was about time somebody to okay. write you know, about these things, yeah, you know, especially yeah, yeah. about the rhetoric of manifestos. Yes. Very interesting book about God and this sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, very, very nice. Now, Thank how you came to that idea of comparing you know, the, those political, ideological texts with yeah. the sacred ones. Yeah, well I think it's it's because once I, and I'm going to talk about this a little later, for me important is the idea that originally writing was very mundane activity done, you know, used by accountants uh, uh, to record economic transactions and things like that. Then they get used to write down stories and then some stories are considered sacred. So this idea of that some written stories are sacred is very, you know, we are very used to that. Uh, today, I think, I would say that all world religions basically have some idea of a sacred story behind them, uh, but wasn't always the case. So I, I made much of this invention of the idea of sacred scripture, and with it, the kind of problem of what I call textual fundamentalism, that then some people insist on a certain interpretation of these texts. And so this is where I began to notice that some political texts have a, sim a similar uh, uh, status. Like, for example, in America, the Declaration of Independence yeah. in the US Constitution, there's a school of originalists that really want to interpret the text in a way that can be compared to certain like literal. Exactly. Right. Scalia, uh, um, may he rest in peace. Um, and similar to the way in which certain religious communities insist on certain originalist readings of, of scripture. So I think it was that those, and then the Communist Manifesto would have similar, of course, uh, uh, orthodoxy and uh, you know, uh, 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 different kinds of readings growing up around these important texts. Now, what do you make out of the fact that in ancient Greece there was no sacred text? I think it's fascinating, and I think it confirms my point that, that it's a very special and unusual thing, uh, uh, and that it didn't happen everywhere, and that it, it is an idea, as common as it is, that really had to be invented. Um, 
And so I think it's 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 interesting. Now you could say that you know, especially with the, uh, um, you, one could argue that the Homeric epics had you know features of sacred texts and that a lot of educational institutions were built around them and so on and so forth. But no, I think they were, it's not comparable to the way the Hebrew Bible uh, seen. Um, or the Quran. Or the Quran. Uh, um, so it's, no, it's, it's interesting. And it just shows that there's really a, a variety of roles that written texts can play in societies. Um, and that uh, in some cases, in other interesting cases, is India, where you have a kind of sacred oral tradition where the Brahmins control the oral transmission and don't want this text to be written down because it meant that they would lose control of it to a certain mm -hmm. extent. So that, that's yet another sort of yeah. constellation around uh, sacred oral tradition and writing and who has access to which... So orality is still with us. It is, and we were talking about it earlier. Uh, it's it's with us, and it continues to import to be important. The way I came to think of it is not so much that writing progresses, becomes more important, and step by step replaces orality, but that each new writing technology re reconfigures the relation between the oral and the written. And we can see that even with our uh, writing revolution, audiobooks are yeah. the fastest growing book segment right now. Uh, uh, the internet allows for a new connection between orality and and and, and text. Um, and we were talking earlier that even before the internet, there are some areas of life where the oral was seen as more powerful. I just mentioned the Brahmin tradition in India. Another would be American law. Uh, the, the jury trials in, in America really insist on oral life interaction without writing, without notes. Uh, it's it's really enshrined at the center of the jury system, in, 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 even though the law is a written law. So it's 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 almost like there's this hugely important written tradition, but at the center of it, it's this purely oral space yes. that gets preserved. Um, so many theorists, uh, communication theorists, uh, talk about the second phase of morality uh, during you know, this period of, of you know, digital. Yes. Uh, Technologies and yes. sort of thing. I mean, you're right. I mean, you, we can see that a lot of people surround you know the written word with a lot of oral kind of yes. things. Yeah, that's very interesting. And and, and if I may uh, ask something, because uh, uh, it seems that uh, all these new means, the internet, which facilitates the way you can express yourself in writing, actually end up into having, uh, into destroying the, 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 the rigidity of uh, writing canons. So you have an orality that is a written orality mm. in a sense. Mm. Right? You express yourself in a way that is oral yes. and I think uh, the, the written text is really uh, subsidiary on the expression in some senses. I think that's right. I mean, and that was true with earlier moments of writing technology that you have sort of an explosion of popular writing, mm -hmm. and that meant, often meant in different languages and in 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 vulgar mm -hmm. tongues mm -hmm. in the in the more everyday mm -hmm. language, uh, and because there was you know Greece was an interesting exception where the written language was relatively close to. The spoken one, but in others, in Arabic, for example, the written form was very different from spoken Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, Latin and the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 different uh, 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 spoken dialects coming mm -hmm. out of Latin. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no. So the, the once you you democratize writing and you have new populations entering the world of writing, they bring with them new forms of expression mm -hmm. and new languages. Um, more popular forms. So, um, so, so that was uh, that is not a new phenomenon. It, it's it's like so many things, not a new phenomenon. <laughs> though it, it it's particularly intensive, and it, it's yet another version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, do you believe that uh, there is such a thing as world literature? And do you agree with Goethe or with uh, Eric Auerbach? Yes. 
You know, it's I, I, I suppose I do, though it's it's a it's a hotly debated topic. Uh, some people don't like the term, and I understand why it sounds monolithic. Uh, how can you you know subsume all of literature into one notion, and what is world literature? And then you have people asking, so tell me, is this text world literature or not? Uh, but I do think it's a useful term, and it's interesting that Goethe uh, developed in the early uh, 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 19th century at a time when something like a global market in literature emerged, because he noticed that he was living in a very provincial town in Germany, 7,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, and he could get his hands on very far, far flung texts, yeah. Chinese novels, Persian Arabic poetry, Sanskrit drama, really texts that were far outside the, the, the European canon. And so I think he sensed that there's something new happening around that. And, and he called that world literature. Yeah. And I think he was pressured because he, we clearly now really live in that era where we have this global circulation of literature, both contemporary and ancient. So well, literature seems to me a very useful um, term to describe that phenomenon. Uh, I personally don't like the term very much, but I agree with you that it is very, very useful, especially nowadays where we teach students that uh, their cultural literacy is not uh, very good, yes. to say the least. Yes. So I think it helps to give them a, an idea about yes, cultural literacy exactly. using the text. Exactly. And you know, I entered this debate about world literature precisely in a pedagogical context yeah. like the one you described, maybe around this anthology of world literature yeah. that I inherited and then edited and, and, uh, and still editing. So, but I, I'd like, so it's one of your is the reason why you don't like it very much is it that it is sort of monolithic the exactly. term yes yeah. yes yes and it covers uh, all the particularities of various areas that have to do with you know uh, specific things that have to do with cultures and ideas yeah. different civilizations and this sort of thing in a way the dominant uh, you know countries in a way tend to always uh, talk about these things in a very general way yes always cutting the edges yes and make things round, yes. presenting them yes. in such a way as to be, you know, easy to be uh, taken by the, the students. So a kind of hege hegemonic, of it. I can see that, though, again, I would, I would, I suppose, defend it using the pedagogical line of thought that you also suggested in the US. Yeah. It's one of the ways in which to actually expose American You're students right. You're right. to a lot of literature from around the world. Yeah. So an English literature actually doesn't dominate this anthology at all and in many of these courses plays actually no role so it it um, I think it helps to rectify actually the this uh, sort of anglophone exactly. dominance that well in fact I'm doing the same thing I'm teaching you know although I do not really like very much the term I do exactly that because yeah. I, I can see you know how useful it is. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, and, and does the way we write uh, uh, change the way we think? <laughs> <laughs> that's a big, that's a big question. You know, I think yes. Though, what does that mean? Uh, so my colleague Stephen Pinker is someone who has spent a lot of time <coughs> very polemically undermining the kind of strong version of what's sometimes called sort of linguistic constructivism or sapphire war thesis, namely that the language we speak and write really shapes our perception of reality in a very fundamental sense. So for example, if the grammar of the language has a certain way of dealing with tenses, that shapes our understanding of time, the way it, it uses geographic markers, it sh shapes yeah. our uh, uh, the perception of space. I think that strong thesis, I think, is probably overblown. Uh, and I think Steven Pinkers and others have, I think, rightly dismantled that by doing psychological experiments with people who speak different languages, who have lost language, and so on and so forth. But I think, actually, that you don't have to go to that fundamental level to talk about the influence of language and, and, and writing, because I, it seems to me, without a doubt, that the kinds of vocabulary you, you inherit or you develop around concepts sh shapes, again, because language is such a social 
a, a, a medium, yeah. and we are such social beings that they it certainly shapes the social world uh, we inhabit, and therefore uh, the vocabulary shapes the way we yeah. are able to talk about and yes, I would say on that level perceive reality. Let let me phrase it in a different way. Uh, okay, fine. Many people believe that uh, we can use the medium or the media in such a way as to conform with our intentions, purposes, aims, and this sort of thing. Is that right? Or if you agree with uh, Friedrich Nietzsche that says that uh, the means that we use yes. to express ourselves yeah. inform yes. our way of thinking. Yes, I, I think I do. I, I do agree with the, with the latter, that they do inform it. Though, again, I think the question, this debate with Steven Pinker is exactly what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and if, as I said, I, it, it, I have no problem conceding to Steven Pinker to say that, you know, if someone doesn't have language, you know, through a stroke or an accident, uh, uh, and nevertheless is able to, you know, perceives time and space and articulate that in some way, or through images and or graphs and, and other forms that language is not the sole medium with which we shape our perception of reality. That seems fine and that seems right to me, but I think we can nevertheless, in a kind of weaker but nevertheless powerful way, use that Nietzschean yeah. idea that the medium does shape, make, makes a lot of decisions uh, uh, we inherit a certain vocabulary because it's also clear that language carries with it so many value judgments. Exactly. Here we have this medium now. Yes. And that medium yes. influences the way right. we present ourselves and how we organize our speaking. And I've been taught not to look at that medium because, <laughs> because I'm not turning my head right now to look at it because it's supposed to be invisible and yeah. erase itself. But it's always there. <laughs> it's, it's always there. there. It's always there. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, let me thank you, both of you, Professor Buchner and Professor Dimirulis, for this uh, wonderful uh, discussion. And uh, let's conclude it here. Of course, the issues are uh, never ending, and, uh, but we uh, look forward to your talk. Uh, and thank you very much, both of you, for uh, honoring uh, the center and being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here this afternoon. My name is Dimitris Demiroulis. I'm a professor at Pandya University in the Department of Communication, Media and Culture. Today I'm pleased to welcome a very special guest, Professor Martin Puchner. Professor Puchner studied at Constance University, the University of Bologna, and the University of California, Santa Barbara. Before receiving his PhD at Harvard University, until, 19, uh, until 2009, uh, he held the Gordon Gabadian Chair at Columbia University, where he also served as co-chair of the theater PhD program. He now is holding the Byron and Anita Vian Chair of Drama and of English and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. He is the founding director of the Mellon School of Theater and Performance Research, also at Harvard. He is the author of many prize winning books which cover subjects from philosophy to the arts and he has also edited a six volume Norton anthology of world literature and I also must stress the fact that he is directing a massive open online course that has brought 4,000 years of literature to students across the globe. His most recent book, The Written World, The Power of Stories to Shape People, History, Civilization. Uh, in this book, Professor Tuchner 
tells the story of literature from the invention of writing to the internet. The book has been translated into some 20 languages. He is also a member of the European Academy and has received numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Kalman Fellowship, and the Berlin Prize. Today, Professor Buchner is sharing with us his expert opinions on storytelling. His lecture is entitled World Literature from Mesopotamia to the Moon. I hope with a short stop in Athens. <laughs> he will focus on the interaction between storytelling and writing technologies by drawing on case studies from the book I've already mentioned. He will examine how new technologies such as paper and print lower the cost of literature and give rise to new formats causing different writing technologies to collide violently. He will use the, uh, this history to cast light on the revolution of write in writing technologies brought about by the internet with the explosion of popular storytelling. Let me add here a more personal note. Uh, the reason being that when I was asked to introduce Professor Buchner in today's lecture, I did what everybody does. I searched the web. To my great surprise and satisfaction, I found out that we are more or less teaching the same things and that we ask again mutatis, mutandis, similar questions, briefly. How important are the means of communication for human civilization? What is the real issue? How we determine the usage of the medium or how the medium shapes our thinking? Why is storytelling, especially in the form of literature, so important for the human being? why the history of writing, reading, and the book is the necessary horizon to understand our digital era's perspectives. Professor Puchner belongs to that rare academic species that tries to answer all these questions, not only academically, but also in a manner that I do like very much, the one that involves his own imaginary quest for giving meaning to that, to what is traditionally called the human condition. For all these reasons, we are deeply grateful for his presence among us today. I am sure that you will give your full attention to his talk and enjoy, enjoy it as another form of contemporary storytelling. And now I invite to the stage Professor Papadopoulos for to give his own address. Thank you, Professor Dimirulis, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Puchner. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Center for Hellenic Studies uh, in Nachplion. Uh, professors, uh, Puchner's lecture is the fifth event in uh, a series of seven lectures uh, which uh, are, are composed to, to uh, the program of uh, this year. Uh, hosted in the welcoming space of the books Archway, uh, we are grateful to the Society for the Promotion of Education and Learnings in Philippe area for their hospitality and collaboration in the implementation of this event tonight. Uh, and of course, uh, most of all, we thank all of you for being here tonight with us. Uh, for those of us who, those of you rather, who are not uh, familiar with the event series, I will allow myself to take a few minutes to uh, say a few words about the series. 
Uh, it uh, is an annual series of events organized by the Center for Hellenic Studies in Greece. Uh, and it has uh, been here with us for the past 11 years, actually. Uh, it is one of the center's initiatives and activities that are addressed to the general public and it includes lectures by distinguished intellectuals and in particular experts from Greek and foreign universities. This year's events uh, are uh, revolving around the topic culture, education, politics. Prominent Greek and foreign scholars engage with matters of geopolitical importance, architectural heritage, uh, as well as with Latin, Byzantine, modern Greek world literature from Rome and Byzantium to the generation of the 30s, contemporary Greece and beyond. The lectures focus on a variety of topics employing the latest trends of research in the fields of humanities and social studies. Event series 2019 consists of seven lectures. It commenced last December in Rethymno and will conclude in June. There will be another lecture in Athens uh, um, at the end of May and a final one in Nafplio. Uh, home of the Center for Hellenic Studies. This year's series is implemented in collaboration, and I should mention that, with the Society for the Promotion of Education and Learning, the National Library of Greece, the Universities of Patras and Crete, the Museum of Modern Art in Thessaloniki, the Harvard Club of Greece, and the municipality of Nefplio. We thank all of them. Uh, I would like to uh, finish by mentioning a few words of gratitude uh, to, uh, to the Center for the Promotion of Education and Learning who are hosting us tonight, and to say that this is a collaboration that has been going on for a long time now, and actually uh, it has been already shielded with the signing of three successive memoranda of understanding since the year 2013 and includes a certain uh, very important, I think, uh, um, um, uh, initiatives uh, such as, for example, the annual or biannual uh, joint conference uh, which is organized by the Center and the Hellenic uh, uh, Society. Uh, this year's conference took place in Ioannina uh, in January and addressed the timely issue, do we need classical languages today? Professors Georgos Babinotis and Gregory Nagy spoke on the topic during the first session, moderated by Niki Tsironi, while in the second session, papers were presented by teachers from the Asakia schools in the Ioannina. Uh, another joint activity between the uh, society and, and, and the center uh, is the participation of the society's students and faculty members to the center's high school summer program. Every year, from the Asaik, students from the Asakia schools attend the innovative high school summer program. Additionally, a society's faculty member serves as a, uh, as a high school summer program fellow every year and holds a significant role in the program, cooperating with the program's professors and undergraduate teaching fellows and supporting the participants' everyday work and final presentations. There is also a joint workshop on digital resources of knowledge and their contribution to philology. Yorgos Trapalis, head of the Society's Electronic and Printed Information Services, one of the main coordinators of this workshop for Greek literature teacher. It is worth mentioning that uh, uh, the workshop content is the product of a similar workshop organized by the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. Yorgos Trapalis, who attended the workshop in D.C., along with Matina Goga and librarian Maria Costantopoulou, adapted the knowledge gained from the original workshop, 
developed and adjusted it to the requirements of the Greek educational reality. There is also an ongoing collaboration in the context of the events series, the series uh, uh, this talk is part of. Apart from tonight's event, the Society also supported the implementation of the event in Thessaloniki last March and has been a regular collaborating institution in past series of the program. Uh, Professor Dimiroulis presented tonight's speaker extensively, so uh, I don't need to add uh, uh, something on this. I just want to welcome Professor Putner uh, and thank him uh, from, the, uh, from the deepest of my heart for being here. It sounds like we will have a very interesting uh, um, um, tonight, tonight uh, with this provocative topic of yours, World Literature from Mesopotamia to the Moon. Uh, without uh, with, uh, 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 without uh, losing any more of our time, I would like Professor to ask Professor Putner to, I don't think he will come to the booth, probably speak from the lab. Thank you again and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the mic working? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to speak to you directly. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, and it's been great to discover that we have so many interests in common. Thanks for the sender and everyone who has made my stay here possible. If you noticed in my biography, both the words Constance and, and theater, I'm particularly thrilled to have Tessa Theodore Ulu here, who is responsible for everything I learned about theater in Constance. And so we have a lot of of ground to cover, 4,000 years from Mesopotamia to the moon. So let me jump right in. So I'm going to try to sketch to you the story of literature. Uh, the reason why I embarked on this is because at some point I realized that I was, I'd been spending all my life reading and teaching literature, reading and teaching written stories, but there is one story that I had not thought about very much, and that was the story of literature itself. So I started to piece this together and to work on this world literature anthology where I worked with a large team of scholars helped me do that. So in a sense, this book and the talk tonight is a, is a result of that, so also a collaborative effort. So when you tell a story, I think it's a good idea to start at the beginning. Now, where, where does literature begin. There's of course oral storytelling. Humans have told stories wherever they have existed. There have been societies without the wheel, but there's never been a society without stories. It's very clear that in some fundamental way we are storytelling animals. That's how we make sense of the world, how it's organized, how it works, how we get from A to B, and our place within it. So this has always existed, but at some point this oral tradition of storytelling intersected with writing technology and that created the beginning of literature. So this is where I want to start my story with the invention of writing. Now it's always a little hard to pinpoint where an origin really happened, what the point of origin, especially in the case of writing, that when that origin started 5,000 years ago, um, we know that the first full writing system started in Mesopotamia, and this is where we were therefore starting. Um, in order to pinpoint that more moment of origin, I want to tell a story, a story that Mesopotamian scribes themselves told and wrote down about the invention of writing. So the very people who were the first technicians of this technology imagined it in the following manner. The story takes place in the city of Uruk in today's Iraq. Uruk was the first urban space, really, so the first time that humans were able to live closely together and live off the proceeds of the hinterland, thanks to new developments in agriculture. And that led to an expanding importance in power of these city-states in Mesopotamia, including and especially the city of Uruk. So the story revolves around the king of Uruk, who seeks to expand his power to the mountain state of Arata. So he takes a messenger, he sends the messenger with a threat to Arata, 
and he demands allegiance from the king of Arata. The king of Arata is not very impressed by this threat. He sends the messenger back with a challenge. If the king of Uruk can transport grain in nets, and the, king, and the city state of Uruk really depends on grain, can transport grain in nets up to the mountains of Arata, maybe then he will submit to Uruk. So the king of Uruk thinks about how to do that. He's, he transports, the, he lets grain sprout. At this point, he can put it in nets. He gives it to the messenger. The messenger runs back up into the mountains. But the king of Arata is still not very impressed. He sends the messenger back with a second challenge and a third challenge. And all the while, the king of Uruk is getting angrier and angrier because the mountain city of Arata is never submitting to him. So when the messenger comes back one, one last time, he lets out this long, angry rant. And the messenger, sitting next to him, panics because he can't remember the long, angry rant. It's at this point that the king, in the story, that the king of Uruk takes clay from the ground and flattens it onto a tablet, puts his words onto the clay, gives this little clay tablet with a clay envelope, uh, this is from the Harvard Museum, um, to the messenger, sends him one more time to, to Arata. The king of Arata, of course, doesn't know writing, and so doesn't understand how that can be a message. Pulls it to his ear, there's no voice coming from this little handheld device. And so he's so impressed by this technology that he finally submits to work. So this is how these Mesopotamian scribes imagine the origin of writing. And for our purposes, it's, I think, interesting for, for at least two reasons. The, the first is that it shows the power of writing. This little thing accomplishes what threats of invasion and armies and so on and so forth could, so you could say, sort of self-serving. These, these, these scribes really want to dramatize the, the power of, uh, of, of, of their technology, though it, it clearly had some uh, historical truth to it, because in fact, it's clear that writing allowed city-states like Uruk to project their power further and further afield. Writing emerged as a, as a way to report economic transactions and to, and to spread these city-states developed into the first territorial empires. The, the other thing that's interesting about the story is that it has nothing to do with literature. Right? It's purely this sort of angry, I think of it as the first text message sent by one really angry king to another angry king. I leave it to you to make contemporary inferences from that. So this is really the origin of that kind of diplomacy. Uh, it seems to have worked, uh, uh, at least in Uruk. Uh, but it has nothing to do with storytelling. Stories were still told orally for hundreds of years, existing side by side with writing. But at some point, one of these accountants, really, who presided over this technology decided to do something very different with it, maybe to write down a story. And that, for me, is the origin of literature, the origin, the intersection of oral storytelling and writing technologies. And so the, the beginning of, of the story of literature starts there at that moment. And it makes sense, perhaps, that the first great text of world literature to emerge from that intersection is the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, which is set in Uruk, precisely the place where, according to the story, writing was invented. And it features King Gilgamesh as the king of Uruk, who rebuilds Uruk, this city uh, uh, with, its, with its, its city walls and, and, and mighty structures. What's interesting for us is that the epic of Gilgamesh presents itself not only as, 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 a, as, a, as an epic about Uruk, but about King Gilgamesh who knows how to read and write. And it's an epic that, that announces that it's being written down and that its hero knows how to read and write. And I think that makes for an interesting comparison to the Homeric epics, so much later, which presents itself as being sung orally. And in fact, the world of the Homeric epics, with one small exception, is an entirely oral world, because Brian Roth relatively recently, uh, to the moment of when the Homeric epics were uh, written down. So an epic that's much more grounded in orality than Homeric epics versus, versus the much earlier uh, epic of Gilgamesh that celebrates writing as one of the great achievements of Mesopotamian civilization. 
So this is what happens when writing and storytelling intersect. You have these foundational texts, like the Epic of Pilgrimage, like the Homeric epics, that become really reference points for entire cultures. Fragments from the Epic of Pilgrimage were found in all, of, all across the Near East, sh showing that they were used very much like that text message from the King of Uruk, maybe to project power and to create some kind of a cultural cohesion. It's interesting also to always think about how these early epics survive. In the case of the Epic of Gilgamesh, they survive for two reasons. One, because they were written on clay, which are very hard and durable material, and because they inspired powerful readers. In this case, the much later Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, who collected clay tablets, and who collected them in the library, one of the first real libraries, that ultimately burned down like most libraries, but because they were written on clay, the fire hardened these tablets and therefore preserved them in the, among the rubble of these clay uh, of the library for, for 2,000 years. And this, the, these figures, these powerful leaders, become a certain theme in my book. The other great example of that is one that you will be very well known to you. Um, this is an image of Alexander the Great reading Homer in bed. And so this is part of that wonderful theme in the, in the sources about Alexander the Great that say that not only was Alexander an avid reader of Homer, he had of course been in, 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 uh, taught the Homeric epics, the Iliad, uh, by his teacher Aristotle, but that he took a copy, uh, Aristotle's copy, with him on his entire uh, Asian campaign. And it's also clear from the sources that he, in fact, saw his entire campaign in light of the Iliad. First thing he does in Asia Minor is to stop in Troy, even though it has no uh, military importance. And he starts to reenact scenes from the Trojan War, showing that he really basically identifies with Achilles. So another reader, legal reader, who basically then spreads the, the Homeric epics all over his amazing realm and really turns Homer, in some sense, into world literature. So you give these foundational texts and often powerful readers that are inspired by them and preserve them in various ways. So I think of this as sort of the first chapter, the first stage in the story of literature. I want to go to the next stage, uh, which is sort of a variant on it. <coughs> which begins not very far from Uruk, also in Mesopotamia, namely in Babylon, where we find a Babylonian scribe by the name of Ezra, here imagined by Christian uh, uh, monks. Now, Ezra is part of a group of Jewish exiles. He's been inducted into the Babylonian writing system, but that's somehow not enough. He assembles a group of Jewish exiles around him, asks for permission to return to Jerusalem. The city had been destroyed. This permission is granted, and he returns to Jerusalem um, and rebuilt, rebuilds Jerusalem. He rebuilds the city walls. He re rebuilds the temple to reinstitute Judaism as a temple practice in its holiest of holies. But he's brought something else with him from uh, um, Babylon namely his, the, the writing culture amongst which he has been growing up. And so he has been adding in exile, he and other scribes, to the written stories of the Jewish people. And now in Jerusalem, he does something very careful. He builds a wooden stage, like this one, and then he, sent, he calls everybody together, and he holds up the Torah scrolls, and he demands that the people worship these scrolls as if they were a god. And this happens, and this for me is the beginning of a powerful a new idea in the history of writing, and that's the idea of holy scripture. That some texts, some of these written texts, using this technology that started in a very mundane way with, with Mesopotamian accountants writing about economic transactions, has now crossed over into the realm of the sacred. And some of these written stories are now seen as sacred. And I think it's a, obviously a hugely important idea because it spreads and our world is very much shaped by the idea of sacred scripture. I would say that today we can't even think of a 
real religion without the idea of a sacred scripture behind it. And not just in, relig in the religious realm, there are also political <coughs> stories like the Declaration of Independence or the US Constitution or the Communist Manifesto that acquire some of the features of sacred scripture. So it's a very important second stage in the story of literature and one that still has our world very much in its thrall. So this is the second stage, the second story the, with a twist on this idea of foundational texts. Let me say some of them are now becoming sacred. I want to move on to the next stage, a third stage, that revolves around a very different kind of scheme involving not kings who know how to write, or scribes like Ezra who act in view of kings, uh, but teachers. Teachers who have gathered students around them and have taught them new ways of thinking and being. The students often have left their old lives and families at home and are following these teachers around. And these kinds of teachers, charismatic teachers, have emerged in some of the literate cultures of the world in the ancient world. In India, one name of this teacher is um, uh, the Buddha, who was depicted uh, in surrounded by his students. In China, the name, one name of this teacher is Master Kong, who we know by the name of Confucius, the Latin name Confucius, depicted by his favorite, surrounded by his favorite students. Um, in the uh, in Greece, of course. The name of one of those teachers is Socrates, here depicted by David at the moment of his death, surrounded by his favorite students. And in the Near East, one such teacher is Jesus. Now, they have many things in common, these different teachers, but for my purposes, the most interesting thing is none of them wrote a single word. Even though they could have, because they lived in some of the most literate societies of the world. Which raises the question why? Why they didn't write, uh, why they didn't use this technology. So as writing spreads, there is here this moment of reflection, of critique, uh, of, of rejection. Here. And it was Socrates who articulated his reasons for not writing most clearly. He uh, worried that written text, once you write something down, can be very easily taken out of context. You can lose control over it. You can never ask follow-up questions. Uh, and he also worried, much as we do today, that if we trust these external storage devices too much, that our minds will atrophy and that we no longer have to know things ourselves and that our power of thought will somehow diminish. And we can maybe extrapolate that these other teachers who could have used writing and didn't uh, rejected writing for the same reasons. So this is what they do all as well. They have these wonderful interactive uh, moments with their students. Uh, but sooner or later, these teachers die. And some of them, of natural causes, Confucius and, and the Buddha, others, Socrates and Jesus, die of very violent deaths. But in each case, the students are now faced with a very interesting dilemma. Maybe should they use writing to preserve their teachers words, and now that they are dead, it's more important than ever to preserve them, or should they follow their teacher's command and not use writing and instead continue to remember them orally? And there are often big debates among the students, um, and sometimes they're all traditions that last for centuries, but sooner or later, they all use writing, even though their teachers had told them not to. And of course, we have to be grateful because it's because of that betrayal, if you will, that we know anything about these teachers uh, through these texts written by their students. So that's a very interesting moment in the history of literature here, a, a pause, critique, skepticism of this new technology. But it's a skepticism or critique that somehow through these students funnel back into literature and create some of the most influential texts. I think in part because these students were very smart. They realized that their teachers had rejected writing for reasons, for good reasons. And the texts they produced were somehow much more vivid, much more dramatic than these old scriptures. In the case of Plato, of course, he even wrote in the form of dramatic uh, dialogues, in sort of plays. And sometimes these were even performed. And the texts produced by the other students 
Conf the, the, the Confucian Analects, the Buddhist Sutras, they were, have a similar flavor. They, they're very vivid, they show dialogue, they show the teachers living with their students. So, so they incorporated some of that uh, oral uh, dynamic on which the teachers had uh, insisted back into literature. Now I said that I would talk about different writing technologies uh, uh, that, that shape uh, a writing. And I, I want to do that by following one of the texts coming out of that dynamic between teachers and students. Uh, in this case, the Diamond Sutra. So this is one of the texts written down by the students of, of, of the Buddha, trans transported into China, translated into Chinese. And it's in China that the Diamond Sutra encountered two of the most important um, revolutions in writing <coughs> technology. What you see here, and there's again a frontispiece of the Buddha with the students, and then the beginning of the Diamond Sutra, it's the oldest surviving printed text in the world from 868 BC, so hundreds of years, many hundreds of years before Gutenberg. Um, and so paper and print are these two technologies that the Diamond Sutra encounters in China, the first printed text and printed on paper. And it's interesting in that we'll begin a pattern that some of the most sacred stories uh, become early adopters of new writing technologies. And for a reason, because Buddhism had become a universal uh, a religion or a system of thought, proselytizing, seeking to win new followers. Buddhist monks were even more, uh, promised rewards if they spread the word of the Buddha. So what better way of doing that than with these two wonderful new technologies that make paper and print that lower the cost of literature and, and begin an age of mass reproduction. And we can now follow these technologies around the globe because the secret of paper making next enters the Arabic world where it is really the technology that, that undergirds, that fuels the golden age of Arabic letters. And again, we have sacred texts using paper, wonderful calligraphic copies of the Quran. But the Arabic world is also a good example of a second effect that happens with these new technologies that lower the cost of literature. Uh, and that is an explosion of popular storytelling. And the Arabian Nights, their story collection, is to my mind the most brilliant example of that. Popular stories that now, and now that the cost of literature has been lowered, are able to enter the world of writing for the first time. And so we have that double effect now of new technologies. On the one hand, the most canonical, often sacred texts become early adopters and really profit <coughs> from these new technologies of mass reproduction. And at the same time, an explosion of popular writing and new storytelling as the cost of literature drops, allowing new readers and new writers into the world of literature, and therefore to uh, allow for a uh, transformation <coughs> of the whole literary system through popular storytelling. So the Near East, the, all these effects, by the way, are only due to paper, because the Arabic world does not adopt print, only paper making. And so paper making really has this transformative effect. And from the Arabic world, or through the Arabic world, paper is now brought into Europe through Al-Andalus, the, the Arabic occupied part of Spain, and just in time for the second great uh, invention of, uh, of, uh, of print with Gutenberg. And you all probably know this story one way or another. So what I want to emphasize here, that uh, in a way, history repeats itself, as with the Diamond Sutra, it is a sacred text that becomes the earliest adopter of this new technology. This is the Latin Bible, the Vulgate, is the first great book that, that uh, Gutenberg prints. And again, it, is, it also leads to a, an explosion of popular storytelling, um, new kinds of literature, the novel, but also religious descent, Martin Luther, are made possible by print. But it's important that all of this only happened not only because Gutenberg reinvented print and he knew something of Chinese print, um, but also because paper had independently arrived in Europe just in time for this invention. Because to print one copy of the Vulgate 
required about 120 sheep to die. So it was very expensive uh, and cumbersome. So the introduction of paper really made print what it was. And then uh, Gutenberg very quickly figured this out and started to print the Latin Bible on paper. So again, this pattern. Uh, and a sacred text becomes an early adopter, an explosion of popular storytelling uh, um, that shapes the world we live in today, namely the world of print, but a world that's also perhaps now slowly coming to an end with our new print revolution. In a sense, that is the motivation of, of this book. And um, the question I want to end with here namely that we are living clearly through one of these rare moments when new technologies um, change the way we communicate with written words. And I think we all feel in our bones how fundamental that change is, how many aspects of our lives are touched by this. So in a sense, what I've been trying to do is look at the prehistory of that and see what happened at these earlier moments when new technologies changed the written world. And so this pattern of, on the one hand, the early adopters, and on the other hand, this explosion of popular storytelling um, is one of the patterns I see when I take this bird's eye view of new technologies. And I should say we're also just at the beginning. With these earlier technologies, paper, print in China, and print in, uh, in um, Northern Europe, it often took some time for the real ultimate effects of these new changes to to play out. So we, we, we're just at the beginning of this new revolution. It will be very interesting to see what happens. Now, I said that I would start in Mesopotamia, which I did. But I also said that I would end on the moon. <laughs> and so I want to do that. Um, so why would I start uh, or end the moon? This is how I start the book. Um, this is a photo that you I know you have all seen because it's become the icon of the environmental movement. It was shot by uh, an, uh, an astronaut, William Anders, on Apollo 8. I think Apollo 8 was the most important uh, uh, of the Apollo missions uh, because it was the first time that humans left terrestrial orbit and shot out into space and where they therefore able to look back at, uh, at Earth from a distance and see it hanging there as this blue planet. I think there's something that happens uh, on aboard Apollo 8 that's sort of the equivalent of this image in literature. And this is why I begin the book with Apollo 8, and that's why I want to end with that today. Uh, there are really two things. And so the, the astronauts were sent up into the lunar orbit to scout out landing sites for the future Apollo 11 mission, for the actual landing on the moon. The problem was that their visual equipment started to malfunction. So um, ground control in Houston told them that they needed to use their own words to describe what they were seeing and also to describe their experience out there in space. And these were, these were fighter pilots. They had really nothing to do with literature. But somehow they developed up there in space their own vocabulary, almost their own poetics of space. It's very moving to me. And ground control in Houston noticed that. And they started to make fun of these astronauts. And they've become poets. And I think that's really true. So they really uh, uh, come up with this amazing this description. Some of them sort of borrowed or reinventing French existentialism, talking about the void of nothingness and so on and so forth up there in space. Other used uh, vocabulary of the sublime. Uh, uh, about the amazing experience and the way it dwarfs them as, as humans. So it's a really, really interesting what happens on a holiday around literature. But the most famous, and for my purposes perhaps the more important one, is a reading that they do. And I call it the first uh, literary reading in space. And they've, uh, they've planned it very carefully. Um, so they're up. In, in, on space, they're in lunar orbit. And every time they disappear on the far side of the moon, they, they are out of radio contact for about 45, 50 minutes. And there's always a lot of nail biting. Will they, re, will they reappear on the other side of the moon? And so the, the, um, they're falling behind schedule. There are all kinds of little technical problems. So they're getting a little panicky. 
But nevertheless, they, they take time for the following reading, and they've actually planned it very carefully, and they've refer rehearsed it. They've written these lines on a fireproof piece of paper, because they were only allowed to take fireproof paper up in their capsule. And so what they do, and then they take turn, they, they reappear, they say, we have a message for you. Um, and what they read is the opening lines of Genesis. And this is, at that time, the most watched live transmission in the history of the world. And as I said, for me, the first literary reading in space. And it shows that the literary history has all these innovations. And of course, in the nose of this Apollo mission was the technology that would lead to our internet and computer revolution. But it also shows that these old texts, in this case, the opening of Genesis, constantly get repurposed for our, our, for our lives. Uh, um, in this case, the opening of Genesis uh, uh, seemed perfect to be read in this position where these humans were looking at Earth from a distance and imagining it being created by the sheer power of words. And so this is how I want to conclude. Thank you indeed, uh, Professor Buchner, for this uh, inspiring and, 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 and uh, thoughtful uh, uh, talk. Uh, I believe we have uh, some time to take up a few questions, and if you are kind enough, you might want to answer them. So the floor is open to the audience. and. Uh, uh, Yes. Uh, professor, professor, that was an astounding talk. Really, really, really um, interesting and engaging. And we thank you so much for sharing uh, your work, your words with us. I've come across this work that discusses about the Gutenbergian parenthesis, saying that our new digital age somehow puts Gutenberg's invention to the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and suddenly, orality becomes a more central part of our communication. Yes. That is not to say, of course, reading from an, another source, that writing diminishes its importance. Right. Far from it. The thing is that right now, we have a new kind of sacred writing, which is called the algorithm. Yes. And, and suddenly, uh, this quite opaque for the many system of writing has so much more effect on our everyday life than anything has been written ever before. So, um, where, where are we right now? Yes. Because uh, it was a very poetic way to end your talk, but somehow, I think the main question of today, which is, what's happening right now? Um, what would be your, your yeah. take in that? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So I think there are two questions here, one about writing and orality in the digital age, and then one about algorithm. Um, so about orality, it's, it's a fascinating topic, and it's, when I started the book, I thought, of course, I have to think a lot about orality and writing in the, for the beginning of the book. Uh, but then it became clear to me that it actually continues to be hugely important. I, one reason why I end uh, one of the last chapters is about the Epic of Sunjata, a great West African epic that's only written down in the late uh, 20th century. So uh, it's clear that, uh, so to, to uh, answer it in one formulation, I would say that it's not the case, even as writing spreads, that it somehow step by step displaces orality, but rather that each new writing technology reconfigures the relation between writing and orality. And I think we're seeing the very same thing now. Audiobooks are the, the largest, still small, but the, large, the fastest growing uh, uh, book segment 
and right now for the last two years. And it's clear that the, you know, the internet allows for a new relation between writing and, and, and orality. But as you yourself said, uh, at no moment uh, in the history of humanity has so much been written and read as, at, at this very moment. Um, and you can think about uh, some of the consequences. I think, for example, that um, yes, some of the paradigm set by Gutenberg is on the wane. So I would say the professional author. Uh, because the author, professional author is in a way a figure for whom uh, the print, print world of print was perfect. Because there's a high barrier to become an author, but then you could reach a mass public. I think that's, and in fact, historically, the, the author, the modern author, as we understand this person, someone who is, is a professional writer who invents original Cox uh, uh, stories, who owns those stories and sells them on a kind of marketplace, is a relatively recent invention uh, and really comes into his and her own uh, through Gutenberg. I think today what we can see is that the, the distinction between reader and writer uh, is becoming much less clear. There are these uh, uh, um, uh, fan fiction websites like Wattpad that be become unbelievable storytelling uh, uh, ecosystems where people write stories and rate stories and millions of them. Uh, uh, and so this is basically readers becoming writers. Uh, uh, anyway, so there, there's a lot that's happening and, and I think that our internet revolution is changing a lot in, in the writing. But I don't, as you yourself said, I think it's a reconfiguration of the world and, and the written. Now, as for the second question, the algorithm, I thought a lot about that, and I thought, okay, should I end, do I need to end with algorithms as a new form of writing? Um, but I actually decided, but, you know, you may, you, you, if you think I'm wrong about this, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, argue back. Because I decided, and talked to a lot of people, um, that no, actually, because the writing systems that I am talking about are forms of recording language and therefore storytelling. That's really my object. Whereas algorithms don't do that, computer languages don't do that. They are a set of instructions, they're hugely important. So they are like mathematics, the same reason why I didn't really write about mathematics. Uh, because mathematics is not used to write down stories or a new way of telling stories. It has a very different purpose. And so do algorithms. And so they are they, they're they're hugely important and there are a form of writing, but not in the in the sense that I was writing about. So I think it's important to think about the consequences of, of algorithms and and, um, and and as I said, the whole internet revolution uh, for uh, storytelling and for the type of writing that captures language. But it seems to me that the, the algorithm itself belongs to a different, yes, come back. You challenged me, so I have to, have to, Absolutely. Have to respond. Yes. Um, given the fact that right now we have AI, yes. who is actually producing art, and actually producing texts, sure. and writing yes. stories, sure. new stories for now, right. but uh, yeah. as, as the development goes, oh. uh, I think we are just about to have artificial intelligence authors. Oh, absolutely. So, and this is based on algorithms. Yes, sure. So in that sense, right. you know, yeah, yeah, they're definitely influencing. Yeah, no, no, you're right. But we are at the verge of having new, I don't know, a, a, a new <coughs> concept yes. of writing out of algorithms. Yes. This so, is something completely yes. unfathomable. Yes. Before. Yeah. Okay. Although, yeah, uh, yes, it is. Although, you know, so often uh, we can also look at precedents where authors, especially pre Gutenberg, so this whole idea of an original story is, in a sense, a relatively recent value. Um, and where you have editors or scribes who basically compile, who com compose new stories out of old stories. The, the Thousand of Nights is, a, is in a sense, a storytelling machine. I, I might, by analogy, call it a kind of proto-algorithm where you have certain formulas and then you can basically produce an infinite number of stories. So I, I think that you can actually look for a present, of, of, of course, uh, and AI and, and all of that is, 
new, and I, I can't uh, help but mention that Tessa and Nikos and I were uh, having dinner last night, and next to us, literally next to us, was Mark Zuckerberg and his wife celebrating their wedding anniversary. So we should have asked him. <laughs> Thank you very much for your lecture, and um, I would like to ask to what extent is the history of storytelling, also history of uh, metafiction, of its meta-storytelling, sure. in the sense that, for example, uh, the first thing that Gilgamesh brings back to his people when he fails to bring the actual herb of life, of, of renewed life, yeah. to, to Uruk, is to bring the story of his own failure and his own effort. Yes. And then, of course, you spoke about the, the Walaina, the, the 101, mm -hmm. uh, thousand one nights as a, a, a device where fiction becomes right. its own metaphor, right. Right. so on and so forth. So yes. I was wondering whether you, you observed in the history yes. not simply a, an influence between the medium and the message, to use Marshall McLuhan's word, yes. but also between the message and it's echo. Yeah. No, so absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And you yourself gave us a couple of wonderful examples. Uh, a few others come to mind. You know, I mentioned the, the, uh, 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 the fact that Pilgrim starts with writing. So that's clearly a sort of metafictional moment, if you will. I, I have a, a chapter about Don Quixote. And what I love about uh, the second part is, as you know, there's this anonymous author who wrote an unauthorized sequel, and Cervantes was very mad at that, but because there wasn't yet the copyright regime we have today, the only thing he could do was write his own sequel. And what he does, he tries to prove every decision made by this anonymous you know, copycat wrong. And by the end of the second part, he sends Don Quixote to a print shop in Barcelona. Uh, and you know, Don Quixote is, is, is amazed by, by, by all the, the printer set up. But then he sees that they're printing the unauthorized sequel to his own story and gets really angry and storms out of the, uh, uh, you know, out of the room. And that for me is a perfect metafictional moment, if you will, of, 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 of the fact that one of the consequences of these new writing technologies, uh, especially print, is that authors lose control of them. It, it's a great, powerful tool. You can reach a mass audience, but you, you have no control over it. A, the control resides with printers and, and publishers. Um, and, um, and of course, speaking of Mark Zuckerberg, the same is happening with our own writing, new writing technologies, where, where the beginning with print and now with the internet is also the beginning of censorship, of the index of forbidden books, uh, of state control, of a chapter about Anna Ahmadova and writing under Stalin, the whole Zamista uh, world, um, where writers, even though print exists, are forced basically into a pre Gutenberg, as Ahmadova calls it, world, because the state controls print. Uh, and so I think we're having similar debates today at the intersection of corporations and states about who controls uh, uh, these technologies. So, yes, yeah, so, so for me, Basically, there is no distinction between fiction and metafiction because I think if you look hard enough, you find some echoes of awareness of technology and ways of te how techno particular technologies connect readers uh, uh, and writers. I would say almost every work, and sometimes it's more explicit and sometimes it's, it's less explicit. No. Thank you very much. No. Uh, I want to ask uh, why all these uh, great people like Socrates, Buddha, Jesus left the world without written texts, mm -hmm. uh, which gave the floor to others, either rephrasing or paraphrasing their ideas. Uh, you mentioned uh, something before, but I want to expand your thought in this specific area. Yeah. So, be because they want to leave room for others to respond and develop. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's possible. Um, I, I sometimes, though, this makes me think of a recent example <coughs> of a teacher uh, who operated in a similar way, um, and that's Ludwig Wittgenstein. Of course, he wrote down his early work, um, but his late work, he refused to write for a long time. Um, he really developed what we now call his late work in 
lectures, in conversation with the students, um, the students started to take notes. And Wittgenstein got his hands on those notes, and he was shocked by what they had understood. And then, as a response, as a way of doing damage control, he started to gradually publish some of his later work. So that would be an example that goes a little bit in the other direction, but maybe you could say that Wittgenstein had been too much uh, grown up in a world of print where he wanted to actually control, had this understanding of authorship. Um, and and uh, so you're saying that there's something um, more open in a way about, uh, about oral accommodation. Yeah, that's a nice thought. Uh, I, I, I can see that. Yeah, thank you for that. Hi, uh, Thanks for this wonderful talk. That was a fascinating summary of your book. Just a very minor detail. Uh, if I heard you correctly, you said that uh, the genre of the novel uh, emerged after uh, the investment printing. And as a classicist <laughs> myself. No, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I should remind you that I know the Ursprung to use my own record. Uh, the term of that zone yes. goes back to the late Hellenistic period. Absolutely. So, so I, I would say... Of course, you know, you had in mind that I would do the more modern uh, right. development. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Just, you know, I would like to clarify. Yeah, it. yeah, thank you very much, Panayotis, for this invitation to clarify. Yes, I think the novel comes into its own, it becomes the dominant genre <coughs> after print, but you are absolutely right, and there are great Greek uh, novels and proto-novels in fact, the Alexander Romance is an interesting example and became sort of a world bestseller. Right. Exactly. Um, in, in my book, I have what I think of as one of the great early novels uh, of world literature, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu from around 1000 AD. It's really a wonderful story of this woman who is really more or less excluded from deep, the deep literary tradition, which is Chinese literature. Um, because that was more or less reserved for men, but then she observes her brother being inducted into Chinese literacy and she becomes better than her brother and then she, she is forced into marriage. Her husband dies, she becomes a lady in waiting at the, in the very exclusive world of the uh, 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 court of Japan and starts to chronicle that secret world and, and does so in a fascinating way with incredible psychological detail and, and creates, I think, one of the great first novels of world literature, way before print. So you're absolutely right. Uh, what's, so what's particularly interesting then to me is that, uh, so you have this variety of writing and genres in the ancient world, and that then this new paradigm of print, in a way, makes it, seizes one of them, selects, in a way, one of them, and catapults that to the forefront of the literary system. And so then we can think about what happens at the other end, at our end of that. And I think there are some people, and I'm actually among them, who think that the dominance of the novel is slowly coming to an end. Um, my friend and colleague, uh, James Wood, uh, uh, has done a lot of hand-wringing about this in Pages of the New Yorker. And I think he's right, because he feels that the novel is being replaced by a return to storytelling. And I think there's really an explosion of, and, and I'm in a way a symptom of that, because I also talk about storytelling, because I think storytelling is larger, it exists prior to the novel, and will exist after it. And that there are indications that there will still be novels, but that maybe in this new world of literature that we are entering, uh, that novels will probably not be as dominant as they were, uh, during the Gutenberg era, although they preceded them, as you rightly pointed out, and they will continue in some in some form. Thank you for your fascinating talk, and it was really thought-provoking. Um, I just um, it did provoke the following thoughts, uh, which are contradictory. Perhaps you know you could you could. Um, uh, help me unravel some of the significations of, of the following. For example, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the relationship really between authorship and, and printing because it's something um, that, that interests me and, and it was touched upon by previous um, um, uh, 
member of the audience. Uh, one thing has to do with, with the fact that printing may appear, um, you know, as, as a loss of control. Um, of, 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 you know, of, of the author over his work or her work, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, according to Derrida, you know, this is sort of based on a Socratic um, version of, of, of writing. Um, it is it is supposed to be yeah, writing proliferating forever, you know, meaning somehow living in, in, in a universe in which the author has no control. On the other hand, kind of kind of a Gaudian. Uh, reading of the history of writing yes. and uh, actually says, you know, suggests that, that printing um, um, it, it bears the author. <laughs> so there is a kind of um, yes. discrepancy yes. there yes. of narratives of, of yes. you know, the relationship of printing yes. with authorship. And yes. I'm not saying necessarily orality had, had, was freer, but certainly anonymity was there before, you know, printing. And, yes. and you know, that's something that, you know, I just don't want to tell me that it, it, was, it would be an interesting yeah. uh, topic to, you know, to hear your yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th thank you very much. And I think uh, your rumination, I think, goes a long way uh, pointing at this almost paradox uh, between sort of Derrida and Foucault here. And I think one, one can see both that, like, this idea of the author and authority uh, uh, is, it, does emerge in a new way with the uh, in the world of print the dominance of the of the named author, for example, the, the 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 very idea that a text is produced by an author rather than assembled by a scribe. And again, I think we are entering a world where where a kind of pre Gutenberg mode of production is more and more coming into its own, where people collect and assemble and aggre aggregate. I mean, all these terms are terms that are much closer to what ancient scribes are doing, who are collecting, combining, editing, shaping uh, what's already there, rather than sort of trying to imagine a completely original story. So I think the, the internet, with its pop, cut and paste and, and curate, I mean, we've, we're, we're developing new words for this curating and aggregating, but these are basically activities that you can see very strongly in the pre Gutenberg world uh, um, are now, you know, they're coming coming back to that. Um, so, um, but yeah, so so this this idea that there is an author behind a text who controls it, who owns it, uh, is is a, so. I think I guess I've come down a little harder on the on the Foucault, uh, although I do see the Derridean kind of uh, proliferation uh, uh, as well. So thank you for that. Mm. Uh, uh, maybe we can take one more question. I'm sorry because we are running out of time. Uh, the gentleman here, I think, is. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. I'm just wondering where does the album, the musical album, fit in into this big narrative of uh, storytelling throughout the years? Because if we really think about it up until the age of the internet, the album as an entity contains yes. both the written word in, in the sense of the booklet that accompanies yes. a musical okay. album and okay. also the storytelling yes. in the lyrics and the music. Yes. And it also has the potential of shaping history as we've yes. seen from the 60s onwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I even add further to that? Yes. Okay, because my question was, where do you see photography as yes. Of course. You know, you yes. Know, it's combination of visual photos. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, both are great questions. Let me take the first first. So I think that's a great idea. I hadn't thought of that. But right, so you have the 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 printed album with the sequence. You have the concept album, right? You have your the Beatles and so on and so forth, the rise of the concept album. And that and so this is let's analogize this to the world of Gutenberg. And now, you know, we're in the in the world of Spotify, which is again exactly the curated, collated, uh, uh, edited, scribal world of people just sort of reconfiguring what's there into different kinds of sequences. So I think that's a it's a perfect analogy, in fact, to what we've been talking about. Now about the, the visual, it, it's a really great question, and I would say my my abstract answer is analogous to what I said about the relation between writing and orality, namely. The, 
different writing systems, technologies don't replace or different image ways of making images, but they reconfigure the relation between images and um, and text. So let's start with Mesopotamia. So we have this the, the material is clay, out of which sculptures are made. I mean, whole houses, whole cities. Uruk is a clay city. So you have these wonderful reliefs. And then because that's clay, you can basically just write across these images. And I have many examples of that in my book. So you have the clay technology as a way of making images even three-dimensional and writing across it at the same time. So a certain relation between image and, and text. Then with, uh, uh, with, with print, uh, so you, know, you, you notice that the, the Diamond Sutra um, is, starts with an image. So you have woodcut images and text. So the woodcut image print reconfigures that relation between image and text. Now, the, it becomes really interested with, interesting with Gutenberg with movable print. So that is a technology, I would say, that actually has huge problems with images because you basically, you know, you assemble a page with individual letters. If you also want to have images, you have to leave some space blank and print that separately and align these uh, 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 these different uh, uh, modes of print. So, so the, the, the print with movable letters is is a form that one could argue, although many printed books with images, uh, but you could say that doesn't favor images, and you could say that maybe because of that, the Gutenberg world was much more text-oriented, and that all the earlier writing systems were much more closely connected to image-making systems, and that we are entering <coughs> such a world with Instagram and so on and so forth, where you have images, but also subscriptions, subscriptio, right? The, the Latin subscript, the medieval Latin subscriptio comes back with a pithy line that you you know you write under an image. Um, so, so image making is part of that story and in an interesting relation to um, to to print. Um, you know, so I've, I think we've come across various ways in which. A lot is new with our print revolution, but we've also, I think, together discovered quite a few ways in which we are also going back to earlier uh, uh, modes of writing, and I'll just leave you with two. And one is the tablet. I started with tablets, um, and the tablet was replaced by the book, uh, the and the scroll first, the scroll, and then by the book. Um, and for the first time, we are using tablets again. <laughs> and there are many images of scribes sitting with their tablets cross-legged. And you know, if you squint, they really look like students who are sitting with their tablets. And the other is the scroll, because the scroll was replaced by the Roman Codex, the book. But we are scrolling down our computer screens again. Uh, because computer, and this goes maybe back to the, the algorithm, not, not from a question, not from a slightly different perspective, because you know, computer code encode text as a continuous uh, scroll rather than these discrete books. So there, there is a lot that is new, uh, but there is also a lot that returns us to earlier formats and modes of production. And so I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with these innovations and returns. Thank you very much.